of our Memorial Library, and I'd like you to welcome, or welcome you, to the inaugural J. Nathan Visiting Scholar Lecture Series. Uh, the library celebrated its 20th anniversary in 2012, and it was about that time that Carol McAuliffe of our development office and I began a conversation with Jay, who you're about to meet, about doing a Visiting Scholars Lecture Series. And it's incredible to think that we, that to now come to fruition in a short period of time, and it will be, this is one, the first of many, hopefully to come, but to have such a distinguished group of people with us tonight, uh, distinguished visitors, um, is a great way to start. So it's my honor to welcome Dr. Jay Nathan to the podium to introduce our panel tonight. Jay. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite an honor uh, to be here at the University of Scranton and with the distinguished panelists. Uh, the, the desire to establish uh, some type of a lecture series came to me around 2002 when I received, fortunate to have a Fulbright Senior Scholarship to Kazakhstan. And um, as someone who had never been to Central Asia, as someone um, now where uh, in the map Kazakhstan is, um, it seems as each day passed, I was so enthralled and uh, so touched by the hospitality and the culture of the people. And by the same token, what I found is that the, the history of Kazakhstan and also the entire Central Asia uh, had, uh, all of you know, under Tsarist rule and later under Soviet Union for almost two generations that the people in that, um, in that uh, uh, area um, have not exposed to, uh, and they, they were not even allowed to travel. And um, uh, what dawned on me as a business professor teaching management. And I find uh, that, uh, that business education, which is I'm passionate about, that to develop and to change young minds, that uh, something in a small way um, I, 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 that I should do. And I also, since 2002, uh, fortunate to travel several times uh, approximately 15 times to Kazakhstan. Um, so uh, that's the genesis of, um, of, of this uh, lecture series of uh, economically disadvantaged or uh, of the uh, politically or landlocked countries. Now the agenda for this evening is uh, uh, Nancy Neal, uh, to my right, a uh, um, yeah, distinguished scholar and um, she spent six years with McKinsey uh, Company before she founded the Atlanta Communication. And um, she will be moderating uh, uh, speakers as well as there will be Q&A. And please find your three by five cards uh, on your seats and hopefully find a pencil or pen. Feel free. I know we're going to learn as much from the audience as we want to share um, our own knowledge and experiences. Uh, uh, next to Nancy, um, um, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Kairat Umarov, whom we are indeed very fortunate uh, to be here, made adjustments in his schedule, um, is a distinguished scholar, and um, um, he has several um, uh, uh, ambassadorship diplomatic posts prior to Washington here in the United States. And please welcome His Excellency. <laughs> now to his right is uh, His Excellency um, Ambassador uh, Bill Dr. Courtney. And again, it's a great privilege and to be seated uh, on the same 
um, panel. And um, uh, Dr. Courtney is our first U.S. ambassador to Kazakhstan. And <laughs> thank you, welcome. Uh, so I'm going to hand over this uh, to Nancy, and, and she's going to conduct the rest of the proceedings. And please don't forget to fill out the three buffet cards, and we want to hear as many questions from you. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. So glad to see all of you here, and it's really exciting to hear Dr. Nathan and our two distinguished colleagues from, with their experience in Kazakhstan, join us in this discussion. I will ask them for their forbearance if I interrupt sometime during this hour with you. Um, I'm supposed to keep us on track, and I've worked with Jay before, and he knows that I actually do interrupt, so <laughs> it's not meant to be cruel, but I, I will let you know when your time is getting a little close or you run over. So please forgive that before we even begin. Um, this afternoon is, has become even more exciting to me because of the events that have happened in Ukraine in the last few weeks. And I suspect all of you have those in your minds as you're sitting there. So that will definitely be part of our discussion this afternoon. And I invite you to, we, I know uh, that we're prepared to answer some of those questions that you may have. And so we'll, we should have a good discussion on that. And by the way, you can use the cards or you can ask questions spontaneously and there's a microphone over here during our Q&A. Um, see, is there any more housekeeping? I'll let just, you just know that we'll have an hour, essentially less than an hour now, for our panel discussion. We'll roughly have 15 minutes each for the three speakers. And uh, then we'll have a Q&A session and then after a reception. So uh, the Q&A may be the, the best part of it all, but we need the foundation of what our speakers have to say. So the questions that were rolling through my mind were, what impact will the events in Ukraine have on Kazakhstan? Uh, will that make a difference in policies in Kazakhstan? So that's one of the questions I'll be listening for. But I'm also listening for a very basic question, and that is how does a country that has lived as a centralized society for so many years become a country that emphasizes individual um, innovation, individual initiative? And I think that's really at the core of what I would look for when I'm looking for how will Kazakhstan prosper in the years ahead. So I'll uh, move us to our first speaker today, His Excellency Karat Umarov. And um, you have your microphone over there. You're welcome to take it off if you'd like. Yeah, I would like that. They're going to show you a short video now. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse yeah. me a moment. Yeah. They want to show the short. video now. I apologize. OK. <laughs>
undiscovered place where wild horses thunder across the wide open plains. You see, we have prepared a lot of uh, good videos for you to see, but since we have shortage of time, uh, I just immediately start. Uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank uh, Jay Naden for a uh, warm introduction and inviting me to speak uh, tonight at this inaugural yes. uh, lecture series under his own name. I, th I know how uh, much effort he put into this and uh, how long he, wor he worked on this. So thank you very much. You have a lot of friends in Kazakhstan and uh, uh, all of them are uh, w wishing you every success in advancing with thank this you. excellent thank initiative. I also uh, want uh, to thank uh, the faculty at administration of Scranton University for hosting us today and for hosting this lecture series uh, on a very timely topic uh, focusing on Kazakhstan. I'm delighted to be uh, today at this magnificent institutional uh, institution, uh, educational institution, which is known for its uh, spiritual vision, tradition of excellence, uh, outstanding academics, and exceptional uh, sense of community. And I thank you, uh, Nancy and Bill, for being uh, with us tonight. Uh, you know, we, we know each other from a uh, long, long time ago when Bill was first ambassador uh, to Kazakhstan and probably his insight will be even more interesting than mine uh, to know about Kazakhstan. Uh, let me just say that uh, uh, you've seen the video. Uh, Kazakhstan is the ninth largest country in the world. It's uh, with 17 million people. Uh, it's massive size, the size of uh, four times of Texas. I hope that we don't have Texans here. Uh, I can change it in a different way, saying it's uh, almost the territory of Western Europe. Uh, geostrategically uh, located in the heart of Eurasia and connecting East and West, uh, being on the crossroads of civilizations of different ethnic uh, groups and uh, religious outfits, Kazakhstan really uh, gained a lot from its history uh, from uh, the immense of cultural diverse which we have in the country. And I should say that uh, Kazakhstan is strong with its unity in diversity. Um, it's, a, it's a country which was on the Silk Road and that's why you can imagine that uh, we had many influences in the history but we preserved our culture, we preserved our nation, national identity, and uh, today, when we got independence, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really flourishing. Uh, with only 22 years of being independent, Kazakhstan is a young country, but I should say, with a no, uh, it, it is a no nation stretching uh, thousands of years of history. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, uh, many observers uh, considered Kazakhstan as probably most vulnerable uh, of the former Soviet republics. Um, there were doubts uh, about its viability as, as an independent nation and uh, that it will be secure within its own borders. And it's because of this ethnic diversity, which was the uh, real reason that people thought, and uh, I am absolutely witnessing that because I myself read this kind of uh, analysis, that Kazakhstan will be actually drawn uh, apart by different countries which are neighboring us. And you know, it's uh, uh, geographically, if you look at the map, Kazakhstan has China, Russia, Central Asian countries, uh, and further Iran and Afghanistan. It's a very interesting neighborhood, you know. Uh, so uh, you can imagine that uh, so many challenges we had and still have in, our, uh, in front of us. And I would like to say that today Kazakhstan survived, have survived, and uh, 
we are a sovereign state, secure in its borders, and respected by the international community. So, by many considerations, Kazakhstan is one of the uh, most successful former Soviet republics. Uh, why we uh, succeeded? Uh, there are three fundamental decisions which proved to be essential for, the, for Kazakhstan in the wake of its independence. First, it's to give up its fourth uh, largest nuclear arsenal in the world. You know, it's a legacy of the former Soviet Union. Kazakhstan, as I mentioned already, is a huge country, and it was used by Soviet Union for installing uh, the nuclear warheads. It's more than 1,000 of them were on our territory. Uh, you know where it was directed, so uh, I, I shouldn't tell you more about this. Uh, second, it was uh, the fundamental reforms, economic reforms, political and social reforms, which we took in the country in a very short period of time, and I'll touch upon this issue uh, later. And we gave the and continue to give highest priority to educating a new generation that really will be building Kazakhstan in the future. Uh, if we talk about our contribution to the global nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, I uh, would like to mention uh, the following facts. For more than 40 years, Kazakhstan had been the epicenter of the Soviet nuclear weapons testing. From, 40, uh, from, from 1949 uh, through 1991, the Soviet Union carried out 456 nuclear tests at the Simpatinsk nuclear test site in eastern Kazakhstan. And this is the largest uh, number of uh, nuclear testing in the world, which affect, had affected almost one and a half million of Kazakh people and contaminated the, with radiation an immense territory. And if you can imagine by size, it's almost the size of New Jersey and uh, over five times of the size of the Nevada test site in the United States. In 1991, President, my president, Nusultan Nazarbayev, unilaterally closed the nuclear test site. And, uh, you know, we renounced voluntarily the world's fourth largest nuclear arsenal. We cooperated uh, with the United States on, uh, on this issue very closely, and uh, Kazakhstan is considered to be the successful country which uh, uh, worked on non Luger program. Today we uh, stand at 15th position among 193 countries on uh, nuclear material security index. But Simovladi's strategy remains an open wound for Kazakhstan, and that sad legacy explains why we are so firm and consistent in our anti-nuclear stance. To this day, uh, we have many backers in the country uh, who knows firsthand what does it mean to have nuclear tested and what the harmful effects you can get, you can have from that. Uh, one of the latest contribution of Kazakhstan to the non-proliferation issues, uh, uh, it's uh, the initiative to host in Kazakhstan the uh, international low enriched uranium bank. Uh, this is the bank which will be under the auspices of International Atomic Agency Agency, and it will uh, provide the fuel for nuclear power stations to any country in the world which cannot get this fuel on a commercial market. This way we try to stop the proliferation of uh, very sensitive technologies to enrich uranium. Instead of doing it, you just go to this bank and get this uranium and just have the fuel for your uh, uh, power stations. Uh, I'm just glad to report that uh, last week President Obama and President Nazarbayev they held a bilateral meeting on the fringes of the Nuclear Security Summit in The Hague uh, and uh, once again reaffirmed their commitment to non-proliferation and strengthening 
nuclear security in the joint statement. Uh, if you are interested in the full picture of what Kazakhstan did in non-proliferation disarmament, I just would like you to refer to the table over there. We have some uh, folder uh, which speaks quite a lot about what we did in this particular sphere. If you are interested, you can read it and uh, really see the, whole, the, the, the size and the volume of what we did in this sphere. Um, let me uh, just touch a little bit upon uh, the issue of economic development of Kazakhstan. You know, um, back in 1991, it was not clear whether uh, Kazakhstan would really become a beacon of progress and economic uh, dy dynamism it is today. Uh, I should say it was quite an opposite view on this. But thanks to the macroeconomic reforms, uh, you know, in just, uh, I toured today uh, the campus here and the most recent buildings, I mean the most modern buildings were built in 1992. So we can have the sense of time here. Just in this 20 years, uh, what we did, we actually uh, reformed our economy from centrally planned to uh, market uh, 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 economy. Uh, we closed the nuclear testing site. We uh, increased our GDP, which is uh, right now stands at 6% annually. Uh, we uh, raised the GDP per capita from 700 in US dollars in nine, uh, 1993 to 13,000 last year, which is 16-fold jump actually in our development. We moved the capital and built it anew in a different location. Today, Kazakhstan, uh, we, we actually kept our education at 100% literacy rate. Uh, we are transforming the whole country uh, into a modern, uh, looking forward economy. Today, we're working on green technologies, uh, just to change it from brown economy into uh, green economy one. So we all did in just 22 years. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of other things to do. But uh, still, I think we've, we've done quite a lot during the short period of time. Uh, today, we rank as an upper middle income country, though at the beginning of our independence, it was just, you know, we were, GDP was not zero, but it was even below zero. Uh, and today we rank uh, among 50 most competitive economies in the world. Uh, Kazakhstan's early and comprehensive economic reforms have made it an increasingly important economic partner to the United States, and today we enjoy uh, strategic partnership relations with the United States. We have American companies which, which work in Kazakhstan, but we would like to have them even more uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, so I would say uh, that uh, prudent economic policies, a careful uh, husbanding of oil revenues, and forward-looking national leadership played a great role in the dramatic improvements uh, in people's economic fortunes and well-being. This is partially answering to your question mm -hmm. uh, how we did it. Uh, Kazakhstan today is the largest economy in Central Asia and in Eurasia. Uh, it's second only to Russia, though you know in Russia we have 140, uh, 145 million people, we have just 17 million. Uh, but of course we cannot uh, afford to be complacent and uh, uh, we today look uh, to future and uh, we launched a new strategy, strategy 2050. What does it mean? It means uh, we know where we are going and what we would like uh, to get by 2050. Uh, we would like to be among 30 at, uh, most developed countries in the world. And we have very uh, rigid plans <coughs> to get to this point uh, by 2050. Um, if I just uh, mention 
about our initiative. As you know, uh, G8 and G20 today tries to uh, work on global problems, but uh, we think today it's not enough. Uh, we think that the whole world should be participating in uh, resolving the economic issues. Two years ago, my president launched the initiative of having kind of G-global, meaning that anyone can log on onto the website, propose the ideas how to change this world, and it will be really noted, it will be worked on, and every year we have uh, a big forum, Astana Economic Forum, uh, in our capital, which gathers uh, a lot of uh, specialist experts to discuss the pressing economic issues. Uh, we have 20 Nobel laureates who come every year to, to discuss these issues. We have heads of state, we have ministers, we have experts, and so, so on. Uh, last year it was 12,000 participants from more than 100 countries, and we invite everyone to be part of this uh, exercise. If you cannot go to Kazakhstan, please uh, come to the website, uh, contribute to these ideas, and we will work on it. Uh, the last but not uh, least thing is uh, the future generation. Uh, you know, no one can really prosper without uh, having a young population which will be uh, ready to meet the challenges of the uh, 21st century. Uh, it was in 1994, it was the country still in the chaos. Yeah, I have two minutes. Okay, good. Uh, in 1994, when the country was in a disarray, the president decided to send young, bright students abroad to study at the best universities. It was a fully uh, paid program from the government. And uh, we started with 80 students. Today we have 3,000 students annually whom we send abroad. Uh, and you know, today we have in Kazakhstan well-qualified young people who not only speak English, but they also understand how to do business uh, with the West. And I think that this will be uh, the best asset which we'll have in the future to work uh, in this uh, world, which is very interconnected lately. Um, I find it very symbolic that we gathered today at the University of Scranton, known uh, for its approach to assist all students, uh, faculty and staff, regardless of creed, to become uh, knowledgeable, committed and active participants in their respective faith uh, traditions. The philosophy of tolerance is an inherent in Kazakh nation. Uh, and I would like to say it uh, very uh, firmly here because sometimes we're very much criticized for our religious policies, but I would like to say that we have Christianity, which is the second most practiced religion after Islam. There is a large Roman Catholic church with over 84 religious communities. Uh, there are many Presbyterians. We have Jehovah Witnesses, seven, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, and Pentecostals, Methodists, Mennonites, and Mormons in the country. Uh, in Kazakhstan, it's a predominantly Muslim population, but it's very moderate, very tolerant. Uh, in Kazakhstan, you can see the mosque, uh, synagogue, and the Catholic church standing not far from each other. And uh, what we did in order to, to close uh, all these different uh, religions, uh, we uh, initiated the Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions. Every three years, we get uh, the leaders of different religions to come to Kazakhstan and gather the special building. It's a pyramid which we built especially for these purposes in our new capital. And they talk about mutual understanding and peace. Uh, I just, uh, I have, some more things to say, but I won't, I won't continue with this. I hope that the questions will be enough uh, to answer for me. I can talk a lot about Kazakhstan, so i stop here. I just would like to say that uh, Kazakhstan is an interesting place uh, to be and to work with. 
And I invite uh, any one of you who uh, never visited that part of the world to come and see. Hospitality is one of the uh, inherent feature of Kazakh uh, nation. So I would like you to really feel it, see it, because seeing is believing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Murav. And uh, let me just do a sound check. Can you hear all right in the back if we're using these uh, mics at the table? Okay, okay, good. So the speakers have I the choice. I hope you did. <laughs> they can go either way. They can go where they want to. I think our next speaker is going to choose the lecture, the lecture and uh, present Dr. Nathan. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you, His Excellency. And His Excellency sp uh, spoke about uh, the culture, the uh, tolerance, the uh, secular nature. And I'm being a management professor I take a different perspective. And through the years, in 2002, I had the opportunity to teach and work with and research. This is my recent book, um, which is Kazakhstan's New Economy, and I had the subtitle, um, which is Nomad and Eagle Hunters Meet Modern Management Tools and Technology. Okay, this is a little sense of humor, if you don't mind, Your Excellency. and. Um, my take on this is first, if you look at the statistics, 70% of the Kazakhstan people work with the government. And as a management uh, uh, researcher and a teacher, I find uh, we want to privatize and have the young and those who are ambitious be able to have uh, choose um, a different avocation, maybe have entrepreneurship. But how this could happen? The business education, which I am very passionate of, and I can tell you in my, in my experience, uh, forgive me, have a little strong opinion that business education in the United States is always reinventing itself, and which is important. And I have three things to say, which are invest in technology, number one. But then, what do you mean by technology? That the adaptation, when you have two generations in that part of the world, under Tsar and then later under Soviet Union, and they were not allowed to travel, and the system of education were a little bit constrained, and so having um, the entrepreneurship adapt to new technology, which is uh, the steps that's uh, really an important aspect, and um, I try to stress that. Number two, developing domestic businesses. Now, the United States, of course, there are other countries, um, we find that, um, yes, um, you can start a business or you do what you want to do, your passion, follow your passion, and make it happen. And if you fail, it's okay. There's a second chance you can keep um, so this, this culture we find in, in Silicon Valley or entrepreneurs and the immigrants coming to this country, um, they do this and see this environment. Uh, so the business education is a big part of that. Um, the four-year business program now, um, it, it is being, uh, curriculum being um, adapted and a number of universities. Now most recently, Nazarbayev University, and we have a number of, you know, University of Pennsylvania, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, University of the London, and many, uh, they're taught in English, they're moving in that direction. Thirdly, internationalizing its resource-based economy. Now, yes, Kazakhstan has natural resources. Yes, oil and gas. We know Russia, 70% of the revenue coming, the GDP, from that. But um, can it sustain? Uh, can we rely on these uh, sources? And are we adding value? Are we processing? And so uh, teaching international business and supply chain or adding value, we would like to see um, manufacturing or making of computers or 
having processing, having a refining capacity, enhanced the infrastructure, and so forth. So in closing, Kazakhstan is moving in the right direction. And in the short 22 years, the tremendous, tremendous progress has been made. And, and everything, I, I, I agree with His Excellency. Um, and I'm very proud uh, being spending time with Kazakhstan. And I'll continue to be um, working and do my research. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nathan, and not least, Ambassador Courtney. Oh, thank you, Nancy. If we look at the former Soviet Union that comprised 15 Union republics, three of them, the three Baltic countries, are now always members of the European Union and NATO. Of the remaining 12, including Russia. Um, in my Dr. Courtney, we're having a little difficulty here. And I don't know if it's your microphone. Uh, is, this, is this better? Yes, yes. Closer? You have to, you okay. have to keep it closer. Okay. 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 Uh, so of the remaining 12, um, I would argue that Kazakhstan is the most successful, except in the area of democratic reform. They're asking you to go up. I'm oh, sorry, Bill. Maybe you <laughs> You don't have discomfort. <laughs> Sitting. That's all. Okay. Uh, so I would argue that of the remaining 12 Union Republics that are now independent states, Kazakhstan is the most successful uh, uh, in every area except democratic reform. And that's a huge exception, and we'll come to that as we talk about some of the things that Russia is doing now in Ukraine. So at the beginning, uh, 22 years ago, when Kazakhstan became independent, remember Gorbachev signed the dissolution of the Soviet Union on our Christmas Day in December 1991. Uh, I arrived in Kazakhstan six weeks later. Uh, we had no idea what Russia was going to do. Was Russia going to try to come across the borders militarily and take control of Kazakhstan? or other countries, we just simply had no idea. But Russia was quite weak at the time. We were able to work out an excellent relationship. U.S.-Kazakhstani relations have been outstanding from the beginning. The very beginning part of it was a strategic trade. Kazakhstan needed Western energy investment because the richest resources were hard to extract, uh, particularly on the edge of the Caspian Sea and in the Caspian Sea. Uh, the oil was light, high grade, but it was deep, it was below a salt dome, and it had a high sulfur content. The Soviet Union did not have a technology to extract that. They needed Western companies. Uh, so Kazakhstan wanted Western energy investment. We wanted the nuclear weapons out of Kazakhstan that were there. Kazakhstan, as Ambassador Marta pointed out, had two fields of SS-18 ballistic uh, missiles with 10 warheads apiece. That was roughly just over 1,000 nuclear weapons, plus they had <coughs> the only uh, large nuclear weapon storage site outside Russia itself, at Semipolitensk. Uh, Kazakhstan had no use for the nuclear weapons, unlike in Ukraine, which uh, objected for a while to give up its nuclear weapons to Russia. Kazakhstan had no use for them, was willing to send them back to Russia, which is what we wanted, and we encouraged investments to come in. Chevron came in to Western Kazakhstan and the Tengiz project, the largest investment anywhere in the former Soviet Union, the, f the first largest investment anywhere in the former Soviet Union. So our relations were successful uh, right away. Um, on the democracy side, though, this has always been a troubling area. As Ambassador Umarov points out, President Nazarbayev and Kazakhstanis in general have had a, um, a tolerant, ethnic tolerant, uh, po tolerance policy, which has really been enviable. In fact, going back in history, uh, during Stalin's time, when Stalin uh, exiled uh, Ukrainians to Kazakhstan, uh, Crimean Tatars, Koreans from the eastern part of the Soviet Union to Kazakhstan, the Kazakhstanis were noted for taking care of these people who were often just dumped uh, off cattle cars uh, onto the land. And so Kazakhstan became an extremely welcoming uh, place. Uh, uh, <coughs> a little bit later, Alexander Solzhenitsyn spent a number of years in Kazakhstan at an electric uh, uh, power plant there. Um, <clears throat> one of the problems, though, at the beginning 
uh, was that all of Kazakhstan's economic routes, if you will, railways, pipelines, other things, all went through Russia. So Russia had uh, what economists are call a monopsonist position. Um, uh, it was the only buyer in some respects and could control everything. So an early part of U.S. policy was to develop what we called multiple pipelines. In fact, we had a phrase called multiple pipelines are happiness. Uh, <clears throat> the first effort was a pipeline through, um, through Azerbaijan and Georgia, so oil would be barged across the Caspian Sea from Kazakhstan, then put in an oil pipeline and go off uh, through Azerbaijan and Georgia to uh, a Black Sea port in Georgia, and then export it out. And then there was a larger Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline that was constructed uh, through Turkey down to a southern Mediterranean port in Turkey so that super tankers could actually uh, take the oil out. Um, Russia opposed that at every step. A good deal of my time in the three and a half years there was working with the Kazakhstanis to, on strategy to try to uh, prevent uh, Russia from putting the kibosh to Kazakhstan's efforts to get uh, oil out uh, to world markets. Uh, President Nazarbayev was very skillful, perhaps the most skillful leader in the former Soviet Union in managing foreign policy. He had a strategic circumstance which was quite interesting. A vast country as large as Western Europe, wh which was incredibly rich in natural resources, relatively few people, 15, 16, 17 million people. So if you're in that kind of strategic circumstance, you want to have good, neighbor good neighborly relations with all your neighbors. Don't want to pick fights. And that's exactly what Kazakhstan did. So it bent over backward with Moscow and with Uzbekistan and trying to have good relations uh, with everyone. And that's something the U.S. encouraged. We did not want, uh, we were not trying to contain Russia and, and promote bad relations between uh, Russia's neighbors and Russia. We wanted uh, all of them to have good relations with each other. That was the best thing for stability and security. Because Kazakhstan, though, has not had much democratic progress, it is more vulnerable to surprises, uh, unpleasant surprises. Um, <clears throat> a couple years ago, uh, at a place called Zhenauzen in western Kazakhstan, uh, oil workers were on strike, and police went on a rampage and shot a bunch of them. This became kind of an internal 9-11, if you will, for, for Kazakhstan. It shocked the country that its own police forces would use, uh, use force against unarmed uh, miners. Uh, sorry, un unarmed oil workers. And so uh, Kazakhstan has taken some steps to deal with that, but it has not taken the fundamental step, which is having genuine democratic reforms permeate throughout society. Because that's the best way to ensure the loyalty of your people, and Kazakhstan is, has remained a dictatorship. The second uh, aspect I'd like to talk about, and I won't talk much because Ambassador Umarov covered that, was uh, denuclearization. Um, right after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Senator Nung, Senator Luger sponsored a program called the Nun Luger Program, uh, taking money out of our defense budget to, um, to subsidize the elimination of ballistic missile silos, the cutting up of strategic bombers, and removal of nuclear weapons and biological weapons infrastructure, uh, either elimination or, in the case of nuclear weapons, back to Russia. So Kazakhstan, in many respects, was a giant military test range. Uh, you will call in 1960, Francis Gary Powers in the U-2 flight, flying over. Well, the, uh, the SA-2 anti-aircraft missile uh, was fired from Sirius Shagan test range, which was the Soviet Union's main uh, air defense and anti-ballistic missile test range. Fired up, hit the U-2, but the U-2 had so much lift, it floated over the rest of Kazakhstan and landed uh, in the Urals near uh, Chelyabinsk. Um, as uh, Mar uh, Mr. Marov pointed out, we, uh, we had there the Semipolitinsky, huge nuclear weapons test site. Uh, <clears throat> the largest torpedo factory in the world was located downtown in Almaty, which is an oddity because Kazakhstan is the largest landlocked country in the world. But there was a, a lake in Kyrgyzstan just close by where Soviet Union tested torpedoes, which is something we were aware of in the Soviet uh, era. Uh, and then um, a Baikonur Cosmodrome which is where uh, the Soviet Union tested its ballistic missiles, but also launched uh, its spacecraft. That was in Kazakhstan. So a lot of Kazakhstan during the Soviet period was closed to outsiders because it was militarily sensitive. And then there was the largest anthrax production facility in the world at Stepnogorsk in Kazakhstan, 
and then on an uh, island in the middle of the Aral Sea called uh, what we call Renaissance Island, um, which is now actually linked to land, um, that was an open-air biological weapons testing ground, and that was shared between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So we worked very closely with the Kazakhstanis. They had a huge amount of weapons of mass destruction infrastructure to deal with that, and that's been a huge success. Uh, finally, let me talk about the Russia dimension, which, of course, is in the news now. We've seen President Putin say uh, in language that some other dictators in the past have used um, that they want to protect their compatriots abroad. Well, there may be 25 million ethnic Russians abroad in various places. Ukraine has 8 million of them, maybe. Uh, Kazakhstan has maybe 4 million. So the second largest contingent of ethnic Russians abroad. Uzbekistan, just south of Kazakhstan, has about 1.5 million uh, Russians, maybe just a little bit less than that. Those are the three largest in the former Soviet space. So the rationale that President Putin has used to seize Crimea, to protect uh, compatriots, is a rationale that he may well apply. He may, President Putin may decide to seize other parts of eastern Ukraine, uh, maybe even central Ukraine, maybe part of Moldova, a separatist area there. Uh, and he might decide to go to Kazakhstan. We just, at this point, we don't know. You have read in the newspapers, just as I have, just in the last couple of days, a NATO commander saying, despite uh, what uh, the Russians say, they pulled out one battalion, which is only a couple hundred soldiers, and there are tens of thousands of soldiers massed on the eastern and uh, northeastern border of Ukraine. Uh, General Breedlove, the U.S. NATO commander, said, you know, it's not clear they're pulling out any forces. We just don't know for sure what they're going to do. In fact, uh, the president ordered him, General Breedlove, who was here a couple days ago, to go back to, to Europe because people were so concerned about this. If Russia were to decide to seize part of eastern Ukraine, sanctions would, would multiply well beyond where they are now, western sanctions. But Ukraine is closer to Europe and closer to the west than Kazakhstan is. If Russia is willing to take the risk to seize parts of Ukraine proper, it may be less reluctant, if you will, to seize part of Kazakhstan, because in the Kremlin's perception in Russia, Kazakhstan is more isolated from the West, more isolated from the outside community, less likely to draw Western support, perhaps, than Ukraine, which Europe considers to be a European country. Uh, I wish I were here at a time when it was clear that the Russians were demobilizing those uh, 40,000 or so soldiers uh, poised on the eastern uh, border of Ukraine and the, and the crisis had passed, uh, but we're not at that moment. We're at a moment now where in the next couple of weeks we're going to see some decisions made. You can't keep military forces in a high state of readiness for very long. They brought in not only attacking forces, tanks, and armored personnel carriers, they brought in field hospitals deployed, poised on the eastern edge. So that's what you typically have when you want to have a sustained military operation. So if Russia goes into Ukraine, there is a significant risk that they will also turn to Kazakhstan and per probably to some other parts of the former Soviet Union. So uh, with that happy message, let me again underline I think uh, Kazakhstan has done a phenomenal job in so many areas. Uh, President Nazarbayev has been a very skillful leader. And I'd like to point out, there's a U.S. organization, NGO, called the Arms Control Association. Every year, it awards someone in the world an award for being the top leader in arms control in the world. And that's usually somebody in the West, it's often American. Ambassador Omar received that award a few years ago which is really a tremendous testament. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know you wanted to hear it speak a little bit longer. That's really amazing. Uh, are there any cards, any people who have filled out questions? Uh, on the cards yet? No? You have? Okay. Can I? Yeah, great. And feel free, by the way, to use the microphone over here. Thank you.
This one is apparently for Ambassador Umarov. What types of products do you export import? Shall I use this mic? Yes. Right. Right. Um, we usually export uh, the raw materials. It's uh, oil and uh, oil metals, rare earth metals. Uh, we export heavy machinery. We import uh, mostly uh, ready-made products uh, from around the world. It's uh, uh, machinery, uh, it's uh, different types of uh, electronics uh, to the country. So uh, the major focus today is to uh, bring high-tech industry to Kazakhstan and for us to actually to get out of this raw uh, material supplier status and just uh, produce uh, regular products in Kazakhstan. So we're giving a big push to that. This one comes to you as well. How do you secure such a long border? This is a good question. Uh, we have with Russia probably the largest, uh, the longest border in the world. It's a four and a half thousand miles. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, the way we are dealing with the borders is to demarcate and uh, put a jurisdictional legal status to the borders. Uh, and that helps us to kind of say some, something happens. We can really claim about uh, something happened to, uh, to the borders. Uh, but we did it deliberately. The first act of new government in Kazakhstan after getting independence is to uh, delimitate the borders in order to avoid any kind of issues on the border. And having a large border with China, it was also important. How we do it? We just demarcate it. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it's not all the territories which you can cross easily. So in the areas where there is crossing, of course, we have uh, the uh, border security. You're getting a lot of questions here. This is my favorite, I think. Any McDonald's in the country yet? <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, I have a news for those who like McDonald's, so now you can come to Kazakhstan and enjoy it, because uh, on the 1st of May, it will be, uh, uh, the franchise was uh, actually signed, and it will be in Astana, and on, from the 1st of uh, June, it will be available in the second, uh, the former capital, Almaty. So both of the big cities will be having McDonald's in Kazakhstan. <laughs> I think Dr. Nathan might be able to tackle this one first and then maybe bring it back to <laughs> Ambassador Umarov. What are the tourist attractions? Well, there are several. Can you all hear me well? Yeah. Can you? Thank you. In Almaty, they have a ski resort. And Almaty being an old capital, and also the European tourists um, historically uh, has has been attracted by Almaty. Uh, Astana is also becoming um, a tourist attraction, as um, His Excellency Umara pointed out. Um, they have uh, opera house, and theater, and um, several other uh, attractions. Also, you know, Karaganda, the central, north central, Shimken, you have in Turkestan. Um, um, and these areas in south, west, and, and closer to Uzbekistan as well, uh, historically, uh, uh, these are um, attracted um, uh, tourists, and they are promoting, yes, uh, it's, it's a good place. Uh, and if you're spending two weeks, you, you can fill up your two weeks in Kazakhstan and enjoy yourself. Well, let me just add uh, to that. Thank you, Jay, uh, for telling us. Actually, if you come to Almaty, it's a former capital. It's uh, the largest city, actually, in Kazakhstan. Uh, you can, in one, just in one hour uh, drive from uh, the center of the city, you can go hiking to the mountains, 
is 40 minutes from the center of the city and you are in the mountains already. Uh, you can go the other direction, you can see uh, some uh, miniature copy of uh, uh, big canyons which you have here in the nice, but they're very picturesque. You can see the singing dunes. Uh, so why it's singing? Because when you step on it, it starts giving some sounds. You know? uh, and uh, we have beautiful mountain lakes. Uh, over there. For those who like ecological tourism, for those who like more active uh, uh, tourism, uh, you can go and see museums uh, in the city at the Silk Road, uh, uh, showing the Silk Road uh, interesting uh, pieces of that. You can see the excavations of, uh, this is the Golden Warrior, as we say. It's an old sack warrior. warrior. It's a tribe, actually. And the whole outfit is made of gold. Uh, it's not gold as a solid one, but it's animal-style carvings. And it's very beautiful. It's the most ancient uh, full-covered body uh, of warrior was found. Uh, you can uh, go, as uh, Jay mentioned, go to the mountains. We have a beautiful uh, ski resort, and we have the highest skating rink in the world, open skating rink in the world where you can enjoy your time as well. Uh, if you go to New Capital, you can enjoy uh, the Oceanarium. Actually, it's, you know, it's a landlocked country and we have sharks there. So for you, it's not probably a big, uh, interesting place to visit, but for those who live there, it's uh, one of them. And uh, you can see an interesting architecture in the New Capital. Um, but otherwise, of course, we have the Silk Road, uh, very ancient uh, uh, mausoleums left over from uh, early years. Uh, we have actually one, uh, uh, let me see, church, which is built from the wood without any nail. It's a huge uh, multi-story uh, church. So you can see a lot of interesting things in Kazakhstan if you come and you have time to spend there. Thank you. I'll turn back to a little more serious question now. Um, I've had a couple of comments about this. Uh, what is the status of women in Kazakhstan? Uh, you know, in Kazakhstan, uh, the women, uh, they enjoy equal rights uh, from the ancient times. Because in the nomadic structure, uh, any person plays a great role in the family. So women enjoy freedom all the time. And uh, it's, a, it's a probably a joke today, but uh, we have more women today in a private enterprise than men. And some of the men today are learning how to look after children at home uh, while women are working. So that is what is happening uh, in, in our society as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's mostly equal rights for women, and today in the parliament we have even larger percentage of women than probably in the U.S. Congress today. Good point. Any dress restrictions, uh, religious dress restrictions? Um, actually, for young ladies, no, uh, no restrictions anyway. Uh, for old, young uh, ladies, uh, when we are talking about religious issues, you know, uh, uh, we a little bit worried, I myself a little bit worried about uh, some tendencies today that uh, young ladies prefer to wear, you know, some religious outfit. Uh, we all the time, we enjoy this freedom in uh, uh, how you dress, how you just behave yourself. And this is a little bit worrying for me because, you know, there are a lot of missionaries coming to Kazakhstan, and sometimes they bring more this young uh, generation. So for us today, important to withstand this with kind of explanation that what is good, what is bad. But you cannot, of course, uh, uh, restrict people from doing something. But usually, if you come to Kazakhstan, don't worry about dress, the way you look. We're very tolerant towards it. I've had one that I think that we could ask uh, Ambassador Courtney. Uh, 
to respond to. Um, it's have there have there been uh, examples of dissent, and you had started to mention something earlier, and then maybe we'll turn again to. Um, uh, yes, uh, dissent uh, has not been a major problem in most of Kazakhstan's independent history, but in recent years it's becoming more of a problem. Um, early on, Kazakhstanis were not sure you know, whether they were going to remain independent, what was Russia's attitude toward the Green League. President Nazarbayev navigated things skillfully, uh, was able to build up a lot of support, and he still enjoys a, a lot of support. But in part because of what Ambassador Kumar has mentioned about the education of the young people, now there is a rising generation of young people who are better educated, have more experience with the outside world, and their expectations are higher for political participation, for being able to speak openly in public about sort of political matters. As uh, you know, political scientists often say that uh, revolutions occur when the gap between expectations and reality widens. Uh, so Kazakhstan and a few other countries out there are having this problem now. Uh, making a transition though from uh, a dictatorship to a democracy is an uncertain process. Uh, Kazakhstan it has hung on to dictatorship too long and now with Russia potentially putting more pressure on Kazakhstan with regard to I think Russians and Kazakhstan the best antidote is to have more democracy so that ethnic Russians in Kazakhstan can feel happier uh, and more satisfied uh, with life. So I think this is the one area in which Kazakhstan is running increasing risks because the pace of democratization is slower than the rate of rise in expectations. You'll comment on that, Ambassador Roman. Yeah, sure. I, I would like to comment on this. Uh, uh, you know, I think dissent is good. Opposition is all the time healthy. Uh, if you have an opposition to society, uh, you really can uh, do something good or affect yourself. And the government today is feeling this. We, I myself, I was deputy foreign minister when before coming here, and uh, uh, we all the time were feeling that there is. Uh, during the Soviet Union, you don't have this, but now we have this uh, growing pressure that the government should be accountable to the people. I think it's a great thing because you all the time go to Parliament or to, to meet the people, you all the time uh, feel a little bit shaped, you know, before, uh, just uh, going there and talking to people. So it's very good uh, that we have this. Uh, the other observation is that the higher the GDP per capita in the country, the more uh, willingness of the people to have kind of freedom of expression, of uh, uh, meetings and everything. And it is an objective process. Yes, we are paying to this attention, uh, to paying a bigger attention today. And we are uh, decentralizing today uh, the uh, management of the country, giving more power to the uh, uh, regional heads, which will be and is right now being elected uh, in their respective areas. So it means that the, uh, when I was talking about strategy 2050, it is very definitely we're speaking about changing the institutional base in the country. It's going to more democratization, uh, changing the landscape, in the country. Uh, it's good to say here uh, one more thing is that, you know, we, we know that democracy is good. Nobody in Kazakhstan is arguing about this. But uh, as we say, democracy is not the end of the road. It is a process. And we are at the beginning of this process. We're in a transition period. If you compare us to any other countries in the Eurasian space, I think Kazakhstan is more progress than that. And we are very much open and, uh, to talk about this. We are willing to get the best examples, and we are working on this. So uh, it's a temporary transitional period we are in right now. But everyone in the society uh, feels that we need to work more on this. And this young people, about which Bill uh, mentioned, 
Uh, they are educated abroad. You cannot uh, stop or cap this in any way possible. So I think that it's uh, the, the work in progress and we will have this uh, thing uh, uh, more developed in the country in the future. This may be related to what you're com commenting on now, but this question is, what was done internally to produce a 100% proficiency in reading in such a short time? Uh, you know, we, uh, to the, it's a, uh, educational system is um, in the process of reform. Uh, we started with the Soviet uh, system. It, it was not the bad system, I should say. Uh, it was a very solid one. But what it lacks is the practical uh, implementation of what you uh, get uh, from theory. So today we are changing the system from just you know theoretical knowledge into some practical uh, application of it. And this is a big change which is going on in the educational system. The other thing is that uh, you cannot see uh, uh, local population of uh, young children going to the streets to earn their money. This is prohibited to us. Uh, we uh, and every regional administration is actually tasked to see that the young children, they should go to schools. It's, it is prohibited to use the child force. It is prohibited for young children to be on the streets. They have, their job is to study. And I think this uh, is one factor. The second fact is that we would like to keep this schools in the districts, in the remote places, for them to work and continue education. Uh, if we're talking about higher education, uh, let me say uh, the tertiary, uh, right now in the schools we study to teach three languages obligatory, native Kazakh, Russian, and English. So we would like to have specialists fluent in three languages. And I think this is that will be continuing this uh, education. As, as for the higher education, uh, I said we just uh, use not only studies but practical applications as well. I think it will change the education system. Uh, so that's why the literacy rate continues to be on the high level. We never uh, actually turned our back to education as a secondary thing. We all the time consider it as a priority for uh, people. And that's why we have this high literacy rate in the country. Thank you. I think we might do a tag team on this one between the ambassadors. Um, this question is about press. So the question that was turned in was, what is the relationship of the Kazakhstan press to the government? Uh, I would ask you to start, if you don't mind, just to say historically, what, what did you see when you were there? And then bring it back to you to hear um, what we have today that work? Um, at the beginning, after the Soviet Union collapsed, um, there was more press freedom in Kazakhstan than there is today, uh, in part because Soviet power had not been fully supplanted by a government that was uh, totally in control of the media. Uh, so there were ethnic Kazakh media, there were media uh, in Russian language, primarily for whole population, because in those days, uh, Russian was the only language the entire population uh, spoke. Uh, and then there were independent uh, media. Uh, one of them uh, that was uh, different from it uh, was called Karavan, you know, as like Karavan and so forth. Uh, it was independent. But then it had a, uh, during my time, it had a, a mysterious fire that burned down a building that held a million dollars worth of newsroom. Uh, Karavan was attacking the government. Over time, those independent media are gone. And this is one of the problems um, in politics because if there is not open debate, it's hard even for the government to understand what are the stresses in society? Where, where are the political potential flashpoints that might occur if greater stress is added to society? So for example, if Russia adds more stress to Kazakhstan now through Putin's effort to protect compatriots abroad, the government has less information and so the votes about 
how people are going to respond, because there's not been open debate about that. So generally in a democracy, um, open political debate is, is a great opportunity uh, for everyone to, to understand and, and be able to deal with some stresses, uh, to moderate views. But if you don't have open debate, often extremist views can be uh, greater in proportion to moderate views than is the case when open uh, debate takes place. And Dr. Nathan has a <coughs> comment he wanted to make before you. <laughs> On business education, yes, literacy rate is very high, uh, reading, writing, and on the other hand, on business education, they use textbooks, uh, the Soviet, uh, that are 1930s, and uh, uh, those textbooks will never be used in the United States uh, business schools. In my opinion, that um, in business education, it is changing, but to have um, young, um, highly talented, uh, uh, students and try to read books that are 40 years old and they're not current, keeping up with the current um, uh, uh, the current thinking and knowledge that is in the Western societies and education system. That's, and number two, um, the road memorization and um, the as a as, as, as a professor and um, try in the classroom that, yes, memorization is good, it's the one way, uh, of course, but then when you apply uh, cases or uh, try to solve a problem that faced or local or, and then that is not applied. That, that, that we need to have that type of uh, practical approach to learning business at least. Thank you. And Ambassador Imran? I think that uh, we all the time have a problem here. Uh, you know, when you look at this uh, cup, you can say it's half full. And, uh, we say it's uh, half full. Uh, Bill says it's half empty. Uh, so we can just uh, have a, a little bit uh, differences on this because uh, if you look at Kazakhstan uh, during the Soviet Union when we have several party newspapers, it's not several, a couple of them uh, for, the, uh, for Kazakhstan and when you look today it's uh, quite a number of them, uh, it's uh, thousands of them. Some of them are pro-government, some of them critical of the government. Uh, when we're talking about this uh, years when uh, we got independence, at that time it was really, press was absolutely free and free to blackmail as well. And uh, for me, for example, it was uh, too much freedom. I'm not kind of a retrograde or dictator as uh, <laughs> Bill was using this word. But at that time it was uh, the time when, you know, first capital came. And there were articles which were ordered. If you pay, you can get whatever article you want. You cannot imagine that New York Times, you can go pay and get the article which you want. But in Kazakhstan at that time, it was the time when any businessman can have its own paper, he can pay a certain amount, and it publish whatever you want or whatever kind of uh, information you want. At that time, it was, uh, I myself was in such a situation when people used the uh, articles, you know, it's 20% truth, 80% absolute nonsense. And you cannot argue with that because, you know, it's true and at the same time it's false. Uh, and, and you cannot really uh, defend yourself at that time. That's why uh, there was a, a big uh, argue whether we have to continue with the same practice. And there was another geopolitical problem uh, with that when uh, Bill was talking about Russia. In Russia there was uh, very extreme nationalists who were actually trying to disturb the population in Kazakhstan, I mean the Russian speaking one, saying that the northern part, the northern territories of Kazakhstan should go to Russia. And you cannot stop 
from publishing it because, you know, uh, that was uh, kind of democracy. Uh, but on the other hand, you know the source of it, from where it was coming. You really, uh, and uh, you know, there's no tradition, old time tradition with the newspapers. There's no history behind them. And that was a big problem. That's why today, I think, the press is becoming more aggressive, but more modern. You cannot go and probably buy uh, whatever you want. So it comes with uh, historical development. It comes with maturity. So we are for the not revolution, but evolution in each and every aspect uh, of our life. Probably it seems to me that it's less democracy in Kazakhstan, but I hope that uh, gradually we'll fill up this cup and everyone will be looking at this as a half full and not half empty. So I think that this is, uh, should be understood, and I'm not defending ourselves, but I'm just explaining what, is, what was the reality. And I was myself a target of this, and I know how difficult to defend yourself when you, uh, the press is like this. Uh, this is one thing, and as for the business literature, uh, what people can read if you don't have uh, anything in the Russian language? Yes, yes. That's why we say today, we have to educate young children. They should learn English, they should learn other languages for them to open the horizon. They need to read and listen to Russian press and at the same time have the access to the Western press. They should read in original all this business literature, everything which is, which is available today. So this is a gradual process. Uh, we will be there eventually. So I'm very optimistic about this. I hope. And I would like you to be to remain optimistic as well. Excuse me, just to clarify, um, yeah, can I clarify something, um, Ambassador Umrov? Which is the dominant? I know you mentioned three languages that are widely uh, spoken. Which is the dominant language? Is it Russian today? Uh, uh, in the big cities, it's Russian predominantly. Uh, big cities, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the industrial cities where uh, historically. Uh, Russian-speaking people who are kind. If you go to the rural areas, it's mostly Kazakh language. And uh, gradually today, uh, it's coming to the television, it's coming to the newspapers, it's coming to everything. And today, we, I should say that we have other nationalities who speak Kazakh as well. For example, if you turn on TV today, and we are looking today for those uh, actors who speak two, three languages, and you can see Russian or German who speaks excellent Kazakh, even better than probably me. Uh, and they can speak Russian as well. So they can speak their, their own language as well. So we see today the multilingual uh, society. And we encourage them to come to the television, to the newspapers, every, in every uh, layer of the society. Okay, I'm gonna go through a couple or three questions and then have Dr. Nathan close it for us today. Uh, we're, these are big topics to try to cover in one minute each or something, but this one's, this one you can cover that quickly. What is your currency based on? Uh, our currency uh, is based on, based on uh, gold resources of the country. And we, uh, of course, it's, it's also uh, linked to Russian ruble, which is you know a uh, close neighbor, but we don't. We we have the, the majority of our resources is in dollars. Uh, the less part is in euros, and the the small part is in, in Russian uh, rubles. So if you take it uh, by percentage, I should say sixty percent is uh, U.S. dollars, uh, twenty. A more percent in euros, and the rest is um, uh, Russian, Kyrgyz, uh, uh, Chinese uh, currency. Okay, here's another one for you. Um, how is gas and oil extracted? Uh, uh, <laughs> if you are talking about shell gas fracking, it's not in Kazakhstan. Otherwise, it's a usual way of starting. Okay, and finally, um, what is the status of 
um, agriculture in Kazakhstan? Um, agriculture is 40% uh, of our economy. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge uh, land which can be used for uh, agriculture. Actually, I forgot to mention, we export a lot of grain. Actually, we number five in the world uh, exporters of grain. And it's very hard, it's very good quality of grain which we export. Uh, so it's a huge territory which could be used for agricultural use. Today we are working on raising the productivity even further uh, of our lands. Uh, we would like to develop uh, a new type of cattle. Uh, actually, we are importing in Kazakhstan live cattle from North Dakota, uh, from Kansas. Uh, can you imagine by FedEx airplanes? <laughs> they are taken there because you cannot ship them. Uh, they will die. And uh, we were doing this uh, uh, through airlift uh, because we were buying those, uh, those which were pregnant, you know, for, for new type of, uh, for new uh, uh, cows. And we are buying a special type of uh, cows, that's the Hereford and uh, 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 Angus. We would like to improve the genes of our uh, cows and to return to the position of meat uh, exporter. Uh, because historically we were the meat exporters, but because of this breakup of the former Soviet Union and those problems in agriculture, we lost this position. Now we're doing it, and uh, having our cows adaptable to very cold winters, which we have, and having them uh, a very quality type, type of meat, I think we can export a little bit later, the best type of cows which could be adaptable to any climatic conditions and it would be very important to me. So we're doing uh, this as well. We are trying to work on machine building, I mean agricultural machine building, because uh, this is a lack for us, we need to work on it. Food processing industries, we have a lot of fruits, uh, some of them could not be sustained because of the lack of other uh, machinery and uh, processing industry. So we are talking here to the companies to come to Kazakhstan and work with us, especially on the organic food, which I think could be a quite good exportable item uh, in uh, our transactions. Okay, you heard it here. And I apologize to the number of people who had cards and we could not get through all of them tonight, but. I will make sure that they get your questions so they'll know to be prepared the next time for what people are interested in. And I will turn now the program over to Dr. Nathan, who will have his closing comments. Yeah. I want to thank Nancy for the excellent job she has done. And I share optimism, and equally, I'm very, very positive. Um, and what um, our Ambassador Umarao uh, has quite articulated uh, the future uh, of Kazakhstan and the progress already made and it will continue to make. And in 2030, um, it will be one of the top uh, uh, 30 uh, countries to be watched uh, in terms of economy, in terms of accomplishments in various areas. Uh, I really thank all of you. I want to uh, thank particularly uh, a group of people. To begin with, Dean Charles Cress, please. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And Dean um, Cress and I want Carol McKell to stand up, please. And it's a great honor to have Carol. And um, yes, uh, Carol has been a little bit inconvenienced, but then she recuperating, and it's a privilege. Both Dean and Carol made this uh, lecture series possible, and it's an honor to work with both of them. And I'm truly grateful uh, for, for this, not only the inaugural event, and, and succeeding years. And there are 
two outstanding individuals. Um, first, I want to begin with Associate Dean Bonnie Stroll. Uh, please. And Kim Fisco, Executive Assistant. Now, both of them have made this possible in many ways because to make the flyer uh, to, to work with uh, the distinguished panelist and put it together with the marketing and communication and most of all reach the distinguished audience that you have been and you are. It has been a wonderful, wonderful event. I want to thank you all. I'm very grateful that all of you took your time to be with this, uh, uh, with this event. And um, finally, most importantly, we have in the panel um, our first uh, U.S. Ambassador to Kazakhstan, His Excellency uh, Dr. William Courtney. And he being here and given his insights, I, I don't want to read his bio, and I've been um, uh, just print out for the last week and the his uh, op-ed, the pieces on the New York Times, and he has been appearing in Al Jazeera almost every day, and his comments on Ukraine crisis and Eurasian, uh, and, uh, and it is tremendously, tremendously, I'm grateful that he is giving in his time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, with us, of course, you have seen the passion and the, the way uh, Kazakhstan, the best of Kazakhstan has been represented in His Excellency Ambassador Umarov. The United <laughs> and, and despite his many uh, of his um, commitments and I literally please come to the University of Strength and share. <laughs> and we want to make Kazakhstan and Central Asia aware. And, and thank you indeed. We are grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, this lady, Nancy Neal, um, is distinguished on her own way. And she is author, distinguished author, journalist, well traveled. And, um, she is a Fulbright Fellow in New Zealand, and she's active board member of the Fulbright Association. Her commitment to Fulbright, as well as many work she does and in Georgia, or uh, several meeting and working with the congressman and senator, um, seeking their votes, and she's very active in many ways. She was also a past president of Georgia Fulbright Association. And she's also president of her own um, <clears throat> communication company. And um, we are indeed honored and privileged to have Nancy Neal. Thank you, Thank Thank you very you. much. <laughs> and please join us for the reception. Have conversation with ambassadors and Nancy and uh, please share um, the, uh, the drinks and please look at the uh, books that Ambassador Umarov brought and they are for you, they are complimentary. Please take with us as many books, as many uh, uh, flyers or there are some uh, calendars. Please take souvenirs and enjoy further conversation with the Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, I just uh, want to mention, uh, we have a travel guide there, so if you uh, want to see the attractions, uh, they are all over there. Thank you. You have a nice man.